Well, hello, everyone, and welcome, 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 uh, everybody, to today's online program taking place here at IBF. My name is Eric Wilson. I'm going to be your host and moderator for today's complimentary webinar. Uh, for your reference point, I'm actually speaking to you from outside of Louisville, Kentucky, in the United States. And we are very pleased and excited to have this valuable webinar with the IBF speaker, Chad Schumacher, who is also will be presenting at the New Orleans at the IBF Predictive Analytics and Forecasting Planning Conference taking place in April 23rd and 25th. But before we start today's webinar, we have about over a thousand people registered from around the world and from multiple industries, and they continue to log on. So we welcome everybody that is continuing to come on to this free webinar. Now, especially for those new to IBF, I want to share a little bit about us. So a little bit about IBF. IBF's mission is to foster the growth of demand planning, forecasting, SNOP, and the careers of those in the field. We're recognized worldwide as providers of demand planning, forecasting, analytics, SNOP education, benchmarking research, on-site corporate training certificates, and advisory and assessment services. Our certification designation are CPF, a Certified Professional Forecaster, and the ACPF, which is the advanced version of the CPF certification. We've been doing these for well over now 30 years. And IBF wants to build credibility in demand planning, forecasting, advanced analytics, SNOP within organizations, and further legitimize the field. And not only do we do this via certifications and research, but we also have global conferences, like the one we're going to have in New Orleans in April, workshops, boot camps, academies. We have have a fantastic blog, one of the best when it comes to demand planning and forecasting. There's a recent article posted today from Greg about predictive analytics use cases. We have things on there uh, as far as blockchain and other relevant information. Uh, you can check that out at demand-planning.com. And we also have our flagship publication, which is the Journal of Business Forecasting, also known as JBF, which is a peer-reviewed uh, magazine that comes out four times a year. So please contact us if you would like any information at all about the great things IBF does to support our field and become actively involved as well as, as a member and join us at upcoming conferences. Well, again, the title of today's talk is Analytical Speaking, Transforming Forecasting and Demand Planning in a New Era. In this session, Chad will examine how analytics teams partners with demand planning organizations to transform the process, the roles, and the perception of forecasting at Kellogg's. We'll look at how the right data and analytics enhance the forecasting process, ensure adoption, and elevate the role of demand planner. Finally, we'll see how advanced analytics are ushering in a new era of simplified and optimized integrated planning. This presentation will help you get a flavor, just a flavor of what will be shared at the IBF Predictive Analytics Conference in New Orleans next month. So a little bit about Chad, our presenter today. Chad is an experienced analytics and programming expert with an expert, uh, extensive exposure to a variety of roles in analytics, supply chain, and planning. With an academic background in finance and statistics, Chad's career includes management roles in application development, leading a team of developers at DLT Database Designs. It was here that he pro uh, project managed the creation and deployment of a variety of applications to support finance, sales, and operations, and demand forecasting functions. This expertise led him to an analytics role at Kellogg's in 2005, assuming the position of sales modeling and analytics manager. He has worked at Kellogg ever since, moving on to director of sales and modeling, and then principal data scientist, and then on to his current role as a senior director of global analytics. Chad holds a degree in finance and statistics from Western Michigan University. And again, he will be sharing his thoughts leadership at IBF New Orleans next month. Now, before we get going with Chad, I just want a few kind of housekeeping real quick for everybody listening. Here's a few reminders. We request that all of you ask your questions in the question box located at the bottom of the GoToMeeting panel, not the chat. Q&A is a big part of these live webinars, so it is highly encouraged. So you can do this at any time 
Then at the conclusion of the presentation, we'll open it up to the Q&A to address these questions at the at best as we can with the time remaining. This should take place about 10 minutes before the hour. Finally, to receive the slides, we will be able to send the slides out to you, but we ask something from you first. At the conclusion of this presentation, about an hour after, you're going to receive an email. We request that you take a very short form type survey at, responding to what you thought, some feedback on this presentation. This is extremely important for our continuous improvement. But also, we're going to ask you to provide your email where we can send you a copy of these slides. So we've been providing webinars complimentary for some time, and therefore, this is our only request from you, is that we provide the feedback so we can continue to provide you quality platform and a quality type of uh, content in the future. So without no further ado, at this time, I want to introduce Chad Schumacher. So Chad, I'm going to hand it over to you. Take it away. OK, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Eric. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm in, um, coming to you from Battle Creek, Michigan today, so it is morning here still. Um, so good morning, good evening, or good afternoon. Um, I know this is a global audience, so wherever you are, I hope you're having a great day. Um, my name is Chad Schumacher. I am a Senior Director of Analytics uh, here at the Kellogg Company. Um, very, very excited to come to you today and talk to you about the role that my team has played in some of the demand management functions here in Kellogg and, and, and how I kind of see us partnering in the future still. Um, full disclosure, I have, uh, I am not, I'm not a forecaster. I'm not, a, uh, I've never been a forecaster, but um, it is a topic that I'm very, very uh, passionate about, very, very interested in. And so it, it's, it's awesome to be able to talk to so many of you today about um, the partnerships that, that I'm able to, that we're able to drive here and I'm really excited about it. What I wanna talk to you about today is um, how the analytic function here um, is helping to kind of modernize the forecasting platform, how we're using analytics and analytic techniques to shift the way we think about forecasting and kind of usher in more of an analytical mindset here um, at our organization and how those in forecasting roles today might utilize uh, analytics to kind of broaden the services that they're providing um, to the organization in a much more strategic fashion. So um, hopefully you can uh, get a lot out of the material. Like I said, I will be speaking in uh, New Orleans and hopefully I'll be able to meet some of you there um, next month. So quickly, a little, uh, many of you I'm sure have heard of the Kellogg Company. Um, we're a very old company. Um, we started off over 100 years ago as a cereal company here in Battle Creek, Michigan, and that's where I am speaking to you today from. Um, over the years, we have grown uh, to a global organization and we've added strategic uh, elements to our portfolio through acquisition, um, and we've turned into uh, one of the largest food companies in the world today. Um, great company to work for. I've been here. Uh, the big majority of my career has been supporting the Kellogg Company, and, and I'm very proud to do that, um, and, I, and I love working here. It's a great place to work. Uh, this is just a slide on some of the brands that we have globally. Hopefully, you recognize some of them. Hopefully, you have some of them in your, in your homes, and if, and if you don't, um, I'll just put a plug in and go, go get some of these. There's some great food here that, that we service. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, forecasting um, in a in a in a food company structured like ours. So in any forecasting is always a challenge in any industry. The in my industry where it becomes a challenge is this two tiered notion of demand, right? So much of our organization spends its resources on trying to create demand for consumers that ultimately don't buy the product from us, right? We ship to customers, we ship to stores, retailers, who where customers go and purchase. And so there's this two-tiered notion of demand. And that is some of the complexity that we get um, that we get in in forecasting in a company like like ours today. Before I get into the, the meat of the presentation, I want to give you a little bit of a background on my organization. So my organization is entitled uh, Enterprise Analytics. Um, and we are all about joining data, joining analytics and predictive analytics with decision makers, right? We recognize that it's not the data alone that's going to add value for the organization. 
it's not you know having a, a a good predictive model that's going to add value it's getting decision makers to use that data and use that model appropriately for the organization right and so when you look at my team today there's really i really consider it um twofold right we have a business facing side which contains roles like data scientists um bi and visualization specialists business analysts and data engineers right these are roles that are dealing and working directly with the business on a regular basis um, and then i have a traditional information technology side which is all working on taking the solutions and providing scale so these are your solutions architects and data architecture which would be working on ingesting data appropriately into the into the platform right product management um, our data technology is a series of technologies that speak together to house data and, and enable analysis visualization on top of that right and then delivery leads to take projects and put sustainable solutions out there so many times the business facing side of the organization is working on problem solving piloting new methodologies looking for opportunities by leveraging new data, building new models, how does that apply to the business? And it's the information technology side of the house that would you know, ensure that we can sustain that over the long haul, providing the value that we've gone after and that we've proven out from the business facing side. The organization, um, the strength of the Kellogg company through the years has been its ability to kind of at scale market and market and produce food right to a wide wide um around the world right to a massive amount of audience and that's always been the strength of this organization but you know in recent years not even recent years i mean the last decade last decade and a half i mean with the emergence of the ways that we can reach consumers these days with the shifting mindset in consumers where they're expecting more knowledge about what's in their food um, they're expecting more customized messages. They're thinking in terms of um, occasions and how the products that they purchase involve their life. It's, it's a whole different world these days, right? And so many companies like, like Kellogg Company are starting to think about how can we as an organization um, still at scale really be more granular in the way that we're reaching and incentivizing our, cons our consumers and the way that we're getting products, the right products to the right locations where people can get them in the right formats where people can get them. And so it has fueled this notion of a company that is digitally enabled, right? And that really implies that across the organization end to end, there has to be a lot of visibility and transparency to what we're planning to do and, and how we're going to be able to get there, right? And so on the commercial side of the house, we have all kinds of work going on to try to, you know, reach consumers and drive, drive the desire to purchase, you know, Kellogg products and incorporate them as part of the life. Um, what we need to do to become a more nimble organization is to be able to give that visibility to the supply chain so that we can actually produce the product and get it to the right spots at the right time. Um, and do this in a very agile way. And in the past where we've been, um, I don't wanna say burdened, but we've been burdened a little bit by the overarching process where you know we decide on a group of commercial plans and it gets translated into a forecast through a process that takes a bit of time and then it gets released to our supply chain um, only for them to come back and say, well, well, now we have issues over here. We can't make this amount of food or we have a, we have a problem going on, then we have to go back and redo our plans. The way to drive a nimble organization is through data and analytics transparency. The linchpin between the two organizations is really going to be the forecast. What are we doing in that forecast? And if that forecast shifts because things that we're doing to, to drive the commercial plan start to shift, then supply chain needs to have, have better, more real-time access to that. And one of the reasons that my team was brought in was how can we get into a world in which we are really um, integrating holistically some of these um, higher level demand signals that we'd think of, right? So in our organization, in our industry, it, it's trade promotion, it's marketing, it's coupon, it's, it's uh, innovation, right? And we wanna plan to do these things. What is gonna be the expected impact on this, 
volume and how can we quickly get that visibility over to supply chain and in turn as we understand and change and course correct our plans how can we continue to influence that forecast to keep getting things going over in the supply chain and so the notion of having a more um, holistic process to kind of start the, the demand management process um, opportunity came to my group and you know, immediately wanted to go and kind of audit what was currently going on in the demand management space. So first thing first, um, you know, my team, just like analysts, what we do is we like to take a look at data. Um, we started to take a look at what we were trying to forecast, right? We're trying to look at marketplace consumption, looking at how actuals are coming in. So in this graph, I'm simply looking at um, actual consumption which is the black prior to the red line. And then afterwards, I see a variety of lines. And the first thing that we notice is that really there's, there's really like four forecasts that are going on here. And um, the organization would come to us and say, which one is right? And I'd say, I don't know. Um, they, all look, they all look high and, and they all look a little bit different and they all look a little bit more volatile. And I don't know which, which one's the right. And, and nobody can tell me exactly why these forecasts are, are, are floating high. We know automatically that there is some inherent bias built into the forecasting process, right? And so, and everybody that we would talk to in the organization say, Ob obviously that's the case, right? There's obviously the case here. I mean, the organization wants sales to be high. They want the forecast to come in a little bit higher, but we can't really pinpoint how we're expecting to get there. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to understand how could we start to identify uh, where some of this bias might be coming into the to the forecast and so we built a tool simply um, to go and identify things uh, that were chronically biased right so for example um, if you look at specific SKUs at specific customers and we could go and say that hey um, you know over the last 12 months you know 10 of the times 10 of the 10 of the months experienced a forecast that was you know plus or minus 20% high all the time, right? Um, that's telling me that we have a significant problem, right? So the first thing that we did was to go and create this tool that we call the bias blitz and get this into the hands of uh, forecasters where they could actually say, I have products that I actually have to bring my forecast down. And we could give them, you know, we can't explain the reason why we have to bring them down, but we know that we have to bring these things down. But the interesting point here was that it wasn't the fact that um, it wasn't that we were able to give them the tool to actually say you got to go and, and bring numbers up or down. The fact of the matter was that we have bias that's being built into the process and it's not addressing you know how this bias is getting in in the first place and this showed me and my team that we had an opportunity to actually go and examine kind of the holistic process from the, from the start and see if we can derive a starting point which would root out some of this bias and prevent us from having to go and do this type of manual manipulation um, down the road, okay? So that kind of set the stage for us to come in and examine the process, knowing that we had to come and examine all of the different pieces that were influencing a forecast and ensuring that we're understanding and generating a good starting point. And what I want to talk to you now a little bit about is what that process looks like and how we're getting there. So what I'll say is like when I go through the following steps, um, many of these things are things that have evolved over the course of a number of years. So it has, there's been many lessons learned, there's been many starts and stops, um, but we have, uh, just kind of learned as we've gone through the journey how to get there, okay? So the first thing that I wanted to do was talk about, we, we also realized that it wasn't going to be one um, forecast, it was going to be a series of forecasts, a series of models that would be talking to each other to try to land into a, um, a good starting point. First things first, we needed to understand what was influencing our forecast. Big influencers, for our business are trade promotion and, and marketing. 
So I want to start with trade promotion, right? So account executives, account executives get, they, account executives need to plan what they, what, what they intend to, to sell. They work with their customers. They work to um, put together a plan that's a win-win, right? Our customers want to have a great, they want to uh, have good business and then we want to have good business as well. Um, and so they have to go through this process of sales planning. Sales planning is very volatile because it has a lot to do with how often we promote products. So we know that um, traditionally that we can go and develop some consumer models that would show expected lifts based off of uh, promotional conditions. So for example, right, um, we have base volume, which would be uh, absence of promotion right at a at a list price that gets sold put on product gets put on a shelf it has a price on it um, somebody walks into a store and buys that right um, it's on your it's on your shopping list you go into the store and you buy it at a base price at other times we go in and we have promotional volumes on top of that right so we actually have um, a discount right you know that instead of paying four dollars for a product you're going to pay two dollars for a product and with that you're going to see expected sales expected increase in sales. And so we knew right away that there was an opportunity to provide some tools to sales to help um, them generate uh, this expected volume. Um, and so we built kind of a Bayesian uh, regression approach um, that incorporated a lot of common price and promotion um, models to provide account executives with tools to understand what their expected volumes could be. So this ends up being a function of base volume, of price, of merchandising, of expected cannibalization, and some other marketing, uh, some other market activities that's going on. And in the sales planning system then, an account executive might be able to go in and say, I'm planning to run these promotions in these particular weeks. And here are some of the here's some of the causality that I'm going to see around the, these promotions. It could be pricing, it could be, you know, display levels or feature or any other types of marketing that's going to be around that promotion. And with that, I can expect to get a certain amount of lift, a certain amount of lift or a certain amount of excess sales, right? And by providing an account executive with this type of model, they can have a good gauge of what realistically, based on their history, they would expect to get with these types of conditions, right? And this helped a bit because we were able to quantify above and beyond, you know, we we're able to start showing some gaps between what an account executive wanted to do and what an account executive realistically would do. It is a, it was a, it was a great ad. It was a good thing that we've done. We have a, um, a system that we call, that we use um, here at Kellogg in which the, the account executives would communicate their plans to corporate. Um, and because of the way that we do this, um, it, it, everything kind of happens um, in a, in a, in a, in a vacuum, right? You plan one account at a time um, and you don't have a lot of information about what's being planned in other accounts, right? And so naturally, it, it, we can't solve for everything in these particular models. Furthermore, we found that um, when we took this type of an approach with an account executive, they might not have been skilled enough to actually utilize this model the right way. There's a lot of confusion about what this model is. There's a lot of internal accountability on this. There's a lot of very optimistic planning that goes from a sales standpoint. And it's done at a very, very low, um, below granular level, right? Whereas from uh, um, from the corporate standpoint, we're really concerned about, you know, at a macro level, how how are we going to be doing? Secondly, we can't build a model and incorporate a model that does everything that we know about sales, everything that we know about some of these promotional effects. So what I'm showing you here is an example of um, what one of these promotional plans might look like. So I have one product and one account over the course of three weeks. And for the sake of argument, let's call these week 12, 13, and 14. I have a base price for this particular product of $3.99 and a promoted price of $1.99. And in the two columns to the, 
to the right of that feature and display, those would be considered um, some of the causal factors that would support this particular event. And what we might want to do is say, um, through through some work that through, through knowledge that we have right internally and through, and I'll, we'll talk about how we get this here in a minute. We might take a look at this and say, I don't agree that um, this particular account can get in, uh, an 80% display level, right? We've traditionally not done more than 50% in the past. And so we might take a look at the volume that is projected out of this particular event and say 15,000 is too much, 13,000 is much more realistic. Furthermore, we might look at the second week of this promotion and we might say, that um, I like all of these. I agree with all of these numbers. 40% is a display level that makes sense. Feature level on week two of a promotion at zero certainly makes sense. And 9,500 uh, units sold certainly makes sense. And, and we're really good with that. And we might look at the third week of the promotion and say, we like, um, you know, we like the causals, but it's the third week of a promotion. And we understand that at some point, diminishing returns set in. And 9,200 units is probably not going to happen. That might be what the model gives me, but 7,500 units is better, right? I can't build everything that I know about the business into the TPM system. And the point is, is we can take into our sales planning system. The point is, is when we harvest the sales plan as a demand signal, we can all of a sudden start to tweak and supersede some of those data points using data and analytics that we have internally, right? And so the way that we do this is to leverage some machine learning techniques. We take the account signals, they've been planned, they've been planned uh, relatively in a vacuum as I alluded to before. Um, they've been planned independently, they've planned very optimistically. No account executive ever plans promotions that aren't going to work. Um, and we take those signals and we recalibrate those based on information that we have. And what we found was that 30 to 40% of the time, we could supersede the planned incremental incrementality numbers, the, the planned promoted volumes. Um, and it would drive a, a better signal to our forecast, right? We also got gleaned as a sidebar, we, we gleaned plenty of insights around the frequency and time between promotions. And we were able to also identify a few cases where account executives were um, consistently able to, to beat beat the model and we were able to call out some of those things. And simply by taking a look and applying kind of two tiers of models to account level planning, we were able to bring about a 2.9.2% a weighted MAPE improvement um, over just uh, item, account, week, promotional planning accuracy. Now, we have to take this data and we have to turn it into something that we can you know, produce against, right? The supply chain side of the business is gonna want, not wanna see down in the weeds promotional volumes, they're gonna wanna see holistic volumes um, nationally so that we can make sure that we're driving the right manufacturing plans, production plans about it. And so what we're looking at here is the level of, the degree at which we were, our existing current forecasting process was working was basically at one SKU or one item and at one customer. And what I'm showing you here is um, the blue circles would be the actuals and the blue line would be the best model that I can do, right? And you see that even my best model here is not going to be uh, a great model, right? There's plenty of times where I'm under forecasting. There's plenty of times where I'm over forecasting back a little bit and you look at the brand that this forecast, the brand that that this product belongs to, and you look nationally, so looking at the entire United States volume rather than one specific customer, it's easy to note that these brands are relatively predictable. These are very easy time series to work with. They have seasonal patterns. You look at um, end of the year lulls and kind of in the middle in, in July, starting to peak for this particular brand. And this is an easy, uh, this is an easier thing to forecast. And the trick is, is how, why are we, then to me, it's like, why are we building all of our forecasts and putting all of our attention at one SKU and one customer? We need to do that, but we can't let that be driving up our forecast. We need to have the forecast be 
somewhat calibrated at these brand and national levels. And while we do that, we have to be preserving the spikes that we're seeing in the demand signals coming at that SKU and customer level. And so the team built in a methodology to um, calibrate the spikes that we're getting down into the weeds against what we would normally expect that brand to do. Okay. And furthermore, the way that we work in our, in our marketing department is we're not marketing to one specific customer or one specific SKU. We're marketing at the brand national level. And when we start to think about how beyond, you know, simply sales and trade promotion, how some of these internal and external factors would be impacting brands, things like marketing tactics, um, size and, and, and pricing strategy, line extensions, uh, innovation problem, customer strategies, so trade investment strategies and assortments, um, external pressures to our business, competitive pressure, um, what we expect our competitors to be doing and how responding to certain things. Maybe there's price going on in, in the organization. Maybe we're noticing that, uh, that, that some of our competitors are doing things um, with, with trade promotion that's a little bit out of the norm, how does that impact our forecast? That all gets implemented at that brand level. And then furthermore, there are just macro factors that can influence our business that needs to be integrated at that higher level, right? And to try to do that at a particular item, at a particular account, at the lowest level of granularity causes a lot of prob problems and quite frankly, it's, it's just not possible. Um, and so at that brand level, we're able to take some of these internal strategies, marketing strategies, some of these customer strategies, some of these competitive things, these assumptions that we're making about our marketplace, and some of these macro factors that are influencing some things and in influence that, that brand forecast by still and still preserve what we're seeing down in the customer account specific promotion um, in the weeds, so to speak, right? And and by doing this, we're actually able to usher in an era of some what if analysis, what if, uh, you know, what if there, there's pricing and, and competition does not follow, or what if they do follow, or what if, you know, what if somebody wants to do um, additional promotion in other categories, what if there's an emergence of private label um, that can help us have better strategy around what we expect volume to do. And so that's the level that we're doing that at a brand level, right? And then finally, everything that I've showed today is really, everything that I've showed thus far is really the confluence of that marketplace um, demand. So everything is consumer. So we now we need to turn this into, right? We don't, consumers are not buying from us. The consumer is buying from a store. We have to make sure the stores have the products. And so now we would solve for our internal sales, sales to those stores. And by using some similar techniques, we're able to take that consumption signal that has been calibrated at a brand level, that has the appropriate volumes and spikes at the appropriate weeks and the appropriate customers to drive which distribution centers would have this and require this data, able to use a series of models to optimize how that would be turned into a shipping or a sales signal, right? So it's a separate, this is the fourth and final step of our forecast process. And here we're looking at things like traditional, what is the shipment lag between um, increased demand due to promotions or marketing? And um, what about traditional forward buy signals where somebody, where a customer might be buying in bulk, right? Um, we have access to some customer inventory, so we know and can bring that in and help that understand when they would be placing orders. Looking at things like skew mixes and shipping vehicles, mods and shippers, and making sure that the that representation of that forecast at the appropriate shipping vehicle is, is making sense. And this is the place that we do this. And by doing all of these things together, by really focusing heavy on the marketplace signal, by really calibrating that, you know, recalibrating that account signal, um, with internal information, machine learning that we know, by calibrating that nationally um, at a brand level, by integrating things at the brand level, um, some of the marketing tactics and some of the assumptions that we're making about the external impact, by solving the, the, the model into the shipment and not focusing on that first, 
by solving it into sales and by using a model to translate that, we were able to drive up some weighted mate improvements by about 8% in many, in many cases, which is, which is a tremendous result for us. Challenge then becomes to be, how do we, how do we enable the change, right? Because in, in, in any, in what I described to many people is all happening behind the scenes in the system. It is a black box. It's not very, um, it's not very intuitive, right? Traditionally, we've had um, forecast processes, which is built off of building blocks in which I say, I am going to account for marketing. I'm going to account for trade promotion. I'm going to add those two together. And that's going to be an add on top of the forecast. And that's very easy to work with because it, it is nice, smooth, clean bucket. And what I have described through this, the process before is certainly a black box, right? Um, so how are we going to enable some of that change? Um, the other piece is that the organization tends to, my observation is that we like to um, be able to point the finger at specific things and say, hey, we had a problem with service because we didn't get a very good sales forecast. Um, and that may or may not be true in all cases, but it's an easy thing to do is when you're able to take a look at the add-ons, those building blocks to a forecast, and they're, they're nice, clean buckets and say, well, that one didn't come true. It's an easy thing to, to, to kind of blame. Um, and then change is, change is very, very, very difficult. And we started and we wanted to, um, you know, I believe in like the forecast value add methodology and we implemented some of the forecast value add, but it didn't solve the problem. We, we expect that a demand planner forecaster is still going to have to work with the forecast. They're still going to have to touch the forecast in many different ways. Putting a forecast value add is great. It shows where we're getting, you know, addition of, of value to that forecast, but it's not actually telling me where I need to go hunt so that I can maximize the amount of value that I'm adding to my forecast. And so we wanted to bring in this, um, this notion of a demand segmentation, of, ver uh, of a behavioral segmentation, where we could understand volume and more importantly, the predictability, right? So if I have high volume, maybe I have high vo volatility, but I also am very highly predictable. We want to understand over time how well our models are actually predicting. And so to do this, we implemented kind of a, what we call well, a cluster analysis. We took a look at um, volumes, we took a look at forecast model performance, and we were able to derive out some clusters of segmentation, right? That would say, here is high volume, highly predictable items, Maybe we don't want to focus on them as, as much, or maybe we do want to focus on them, but not as much as we want to focus on high volume, low predictable items. And the key to this being successful for us was not to do a one and done here, but to create this as a byproduct of our weekly forecasting and modeling process, right? Every week, we're going through this process of integrating these four steps that I walked through earlier. A byproduct of that is what the demand segmentation looks like. It gets loaded into the system and forecasters know immediately where they can go, touch the forecast and add the most value, right? On top of that, now we can use forecast value add to show not just uh, to enforce behavior change, but to actually showcase great performance and great adoption of this. And furthermore, if you have the right data environment, if you are understanding the model, if you are understanding the override, you're understanding the value that that override, that touch point might be doing, now I have the makings for leveraging some machine learning to understand the circumstances around those touch points, which ones are the most probable to add the most value, and start to incorporate that into my, um, into my methodology as well, so that if we can suggest or automate you know, overrides that are highly probable to add value to my forecast, that can just be baked into as part of the process. So this was pretty key to driving some of the behavioral changes for us. Um, again, heavily rooted in data analytics and heavily rooted in partnership with the demand planners to, to drive the best uh, methodology for this. And the last section then I guess that I'll go through is kind of my thoughts on where I would like to see us partnering more with our forecasting organization 
to um, kind of broaden the services that they're providing to the organization. Um, and I see this through equipping them with the right data, the right tool, the right, the right analytics to offer these, these types of services up. And one would be um, to expand the role as demand consultants. So what you're looking at here is a graph of um, um, data that we've been able that we're able that we get at Kellogg's. Right, this is point of sale data. So it's just it's it's um, um, for for a, a major not a majority for a number of our customers we're able to get um, daily sales um, by store by UPC and we're able to start and with with that we're able to get um, addresses on those stores and able to tie them into specific zip codes. And what I would, what we're working towards now is um, equipping the organization with tools to understand where there may be some opportunities to um, influence and shape demand across the, the region. Again, this gets into not just doing, you know, one broad-based marketing campaign, but being able to go and target specific geographies and specific regions with specific programs, and then specifically understanding the impact of some regional phenomena. So. Um, maybe it's a political convention or a hurricane or a sporting event that's happening in a certain region. And over time, we start to understand what is the impact on some of those volumes. And then how can we um, turn that into opportunities for the organization, right? Another one could be, um, and this is something that we're starting to pilot, is risk analysis when, um, when there's planning that happens. So if we go back to the example of, of account executives, for us, we would have you know, we could have, uh, you know, we could have a several thousand account executives all planning, planning, you know, events and promotional types of events, you know, several times across all the categories that they serve um, with their customers regularly, right? And so they're planning these things one event at a time. And, and what you're looking at on the left here is kind of a simulation of what one of these events might look like. This is a, this is a live example, but it's, it's, it's one promotion and looking at the likelihood of uh, when these types of promotions run in the past, what some of those causal conditions are. And we're able to simulate and understand where we are likely to see volume. So what you're seeing on the bottom is um, on the horizontal axis, you're seeing actual volumes that go up. And on the vertical axis, you're seeing the likelihood of those events actually happening. And so volumes that would be planned that would be along the green would be things that we would think would be likely to uh, likely to occur or within the realm of possibility for occurring. And, and things as they go up into the yellow, into the red would be less likely to occur. And if you think about the perspective when you're planning an event at a time, um, it makes sense. You might want to plan some things in the red. Um, I'm planning to execute very well. There's other circumstances going on. But when you start to look holistically at how all of these events being planned um, come, come to light, it certainly showcases that we may have some risk that's starting to mount. And so the thought would be, I'd like to see the, um, you know, the organization have the ability to take a look at on the, on the right, like a heat map to say, you know, where I'm seeing pockets of green, those are plans that are relatively reasonably likely, or I'm seeing pockets of just deep red, consistent red, those are plans that every single event is starting to be planned in the realm of possibility where it's, it's a little bit less likely. And so the, the, you know, the chances of all of those events actually manifesting with those particular volumes would be, um, would be, very, would be very light, right? That's, that's not very probable. And so this type of risk assessment coming out of the demand organization um, would be a tremendous service for our, for our corporate um, strategic functions to understand where they might want to go and where they potentially have risks in, mm -hmm. in the business. And then finally, I believe that um, if we start thinking about integrating demand signals the right way statistically, not building blocks where I have Mutual, mutually exclusive buckets, but I'm integrating things holistically, um, statistically, it provides, we can start to build some tools in which leadership can start to think about how they might want to um, deploy their resources across the, the common demand drivers. So media, trade, pricing, distribution, coupons, 
um, whatever it might be, digital um, offers, uh, whatever it might be, give them an ability to to start to understand the impact of making different decisions with how they use that resourcing. Give them the ability to run that simulation and start thinking and partnering with that, thinking with that model, understanding, giving them the capability to, to um, kind of save different snapshots of that resource use in the different scenarios. And if you get your leadership thinking that way, where I'm simulating something, I'm having scenarios where I'm able to compare scenario one, scenario two, scenario three, now I have opportunities over, over time as we learn with that mentality baked in where um, we might be able to bring in some optimization type methodology, might be able to bring in some, some AI, some machine learning to help suggest um, ways to deploy those resources that we might not have thought about. And also bringing in external impacts that might be hindering or hurting us that, that we haven't really accounted for necessarily. So it helps the organization um, kind of elevate its game in demand management, demand planning. And I really think that there's an opportunity with, you know, shifting the forecast into this, into this, um, you know, model feeding, model feeding, model type of mentality where we can actually start to, to bring this um, forward to the organization. Okay. So those are some of the opportunities that I kind of see us coming over the next couple of years. And that's where I would like to see, um, an analytics group such as mine be partnering with the demand management teams to start to bring these things to life and start to really enable that function to be that much more strategic going forward. Okay, that is my content. Um, there is a little bit of time for question. I will be, um, as I said earlier, I will be at the, um, the conference in New Orleans later uh, next month, and I'm really looking forward to um, seeing. It looks like it's going to be a pretty good con. Uh, conference and I'm looking forward to being there and, and hopefully meeting some of you and having a chance to hear from um, some of my colleagues and peers. Thank you, Chad. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we are going to open up for questions. I've got a lot of questions coming in already. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get them all, but I'll definitely uh, be able to uh, touch on a few of these and hopefully we can follow up afterwards with uh, some of them specifically as well. So thank you again, Chad. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things I want to ask as far as you mentioned the demand consultant or you know utilizing some of this for more prescriptive type of analytics uh, going forward or demand shifting demand shaping whichever one you want to look at do you have any kind of uh, stories or anecdotes of, as far as like pop tarts uh, during hurricanes I think there's you know I don't know if you have any stories around that but you're kind of on the spot um, yeah, well, hop, pop tarts do well during hurricanes, and um, it'd be nice if we could, you know, if it'd be nice if we could plan on hurricanes to generate sales. But uh, pop tarts does do well in hurricanes, um, and the theory is that it's a it's a comfort food, and it's it's also um, it does not require refrigeration, and you know, it's it's something that 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 people like. We, there's significant evidence of pop tarts doing well in in hurricanes. As a matter of fact. We have been able to use this daily point of sale data that I was talking about um, a few slides back where I showed that map of the um, this one. Um, this is daily data that comes in and we were able to tie this up with the hurricane patterns, the weather hurricane patterns to actually go and show um, what that um, what that stockpile with that pantry loading is prior to that hurricane coming in. And it is pretty interesting to see that. And as soon as that hurricane gets announced, you're starting to see, you know, stores requesting more orders start to go up. You're starting to see this is consumer purchase here because this, this would be the end consumer. You're actually able to see that hurricane coming in and then over time what those purchase patterns are. Um, it is interesting to, to see that. And it would be nice and get this gets into kind of what I was mentioning earlier with the, the organization being much more nimble, right? I mean, traditionally, an organization like us has had to have, you know, a significant several month lead time on an event like that. If we know within, you know, a couple of weeks that there's going to be an event like that and we have an opportunity to get um, product down into where, where that's going to happen, it would be great to be able to you know, to be able to run that through and understand quickly what the impact that demand is going to be and make sure that we can get that into the pipeline quicker. So it's, it's nimble agility, um, something that, you know, big organizations like ours has struggled with. 
Okay. Uh, as far as creating some of those forecasts, I know a lot of questions are coming in is what type of forecast you're using. And I think knowing your software, using a lot of Alima models for uh, your modeling, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the economist now, piece, yeah, and then for the for the um, for the consumer response, we actually use mixed modeling for that. Okay. That's, that's and, and you. Yeah. Go ahead. No, that's okay. So, and, um, so that's yeah, that's just like a it's a it's a multi multiplicative, um, log log model, traditional random effect type of a model where we get various coefficients out of that, and and we use that. That's the first. Thing that we go into before we get into the ARIMA modeling. Great, and it looks like you're creating, you know, some probabilistic as well. It looks like you have some range forecast that your output, and you mentioned you you guys are feeding the demand planners and forecasters the a signal that they then will add market intelligence, other types of you know information onto to generate a consensus forecast. I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of your process, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. Are you providing them a discrete demand signal that they then operate? Because I know a lot of uh, you know the MRP and, and and a lot of the systems downstream for you utilize a discrete signal. Are you providing a more of a discrete signal, or are you actually providing that? Hey, here's the range. Operate within that range. I mean, what what signal are you providing to the demand planners? So it is a discrete signal. So it is a discrete signal. So it's actually a, a it's actually a point estimate in time, right? Of of where we expect things to go. We don't get into ranges here, um, but it's an interesting concept. I, I love the idea of getting into forecast ranges, highs and lows, and in confidence. Um, we just we, we haven't got there yet. Okay. Yeah. And then we're, you're measuring. I noticed you uh, said your weighted MAPE. Uh, is a lot of what you're looking at as far as measuring your forecast accuracy. Uh, are you, is that the end consensus forecast? Or are you measuring at the point you deliver to the demand planners and they, they're they measuring and is that your forecast value add? Uh, so what so the measurements final, the final are you using the versus consensus. their measuring? So that's consensus. So I, when I think of the whole program, I, I think of it as much more than just the model, right? The model comes, it initializes that forecast, the behavioral segmentation needs to occur where it's driving um, the forecasters to work and touch that forecast. We expect them to touch the forecast. I, I am not one of these that believe that, you know, we should never touch the model and all of that. I really don't believe that's the case at all. And so when I think about um, the, the, the program, I don't think of them as separate. I don't think about we build a model and the model's great and all that. I, I think, you know, it's only successful if we're using it the right way. And if we're using that segmentation to drive behaviors to further improve upon it, and that's where the big value gets added, is when those forecasters actually work with the model the right way. So those MAPES would be after they have gone and interacted with that model. Okay. We have a couple good questions come in about, you know, as far as the, the data and what you're using, and as far as you mentioned holistic modeling, uh, and I'm kind of curious as well, I mean, are you doing any kind of data pruning to any of the promotion data or the time series that you use, e either one? Uh, are you doing any kind of data pruning before you model? You're talking about right like now. Cor correcting the data? Or, yeah, or, yeah, or, yes. Um, just in, the, there's just a few things. So over- Cleansing, night, you know, however you yeah, want to look at it. We don't do yeah. a lot of cleansing. Um, there, there are a few cases where we will do it. Um, there are a few cases of things that have happened in the past that are just not reflective of the business going forward. And it's very, um, it makes sense to go and do that, but to go and cleanse that. But um, we try not to do too much of that. Um, a couple examples of where we would do that is um, if we've had um, in our game, we, we do lots of, um, you know, different packs, right? So we have, you know, we sometimes we will offer uh, a new pack with a new with more food in or food out or for whatever reason, right? Um, and we'll remove um, a particular UPC um, out of the but but they're really kind of it's kind of continuous and we might go back and restate the history against the new pack. Um, there's been a few instances where internally where we've had some maybe a supply chain issue that we just don't feel like is going to is necessarily reflective of the future um, and we might cut that cut those pieces out 
I would say it's, it's, it's rare. We're really not doing a lot of it. On the consumption side, very little, very, very little um, of actually pruning or cleansing the data ahead of time. Okay. We had a couple questions about as far as you mentioned, you looked at the kind of the quadrant of forecastability or kind of the variability you have uh, versus the volume. There's a lot of companies, especially we're seeing now with the long tail. I mean, there's some companies that have majority of their products have this long tail or in, uh, intermittent, intermittent demand type patterns. I'm assuming you're starting to see that now as well with some of your products. I mean, how is you treat those differently? Are they grouped together? How do we forecast those? Is there any suggestions? Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I think this gets into like, I think forecasting at the right level. So if we go back to a Pop-Tarts example, right? We have an eight, eight count Pop-Tart where it would make sense to where that, that's relatively, um, it, that's relatively predictable. It's always going to be there, right? Some of the particular skews and flavors and pack sizes underneath it might have a lot of that intermittent type things. There, there's a lot of customers that will um, that will take a product, right? And that's the other thing that we deal with is that not everybody takes every single product all the time. So they might take it for six months and then they might swap it with something else. And so it gets to be very tricky. Um, what we would do in cases like that is um, as part of that sales planning system is we try to understand what products that they're going to be carrying and when, and we try to, um, you know, at least provide some volume into those so that so that there's that there's that there's data there right for the for the appropriate period of time. Again, still making sure that where the time series makes sense, where that we can really use those ARIMA models or those or those regression models. Um, trying to hold true to that as best as possible. It does cause a lot of noise in the system, um, absolutely. And in many cases, we've done lots of work around profiling, um, you know, a new product or profiling a new flavor um, based off of things that we're seeing. Point of sale data gives you the ability to understand, you know, early on that, you know, two, three weeks after a launch, this thing is looking like um, something that had happened, another launch that had happened in the past, and we might be able to reshape some of the uh, future forecasts based off of, based off of that. It's a tricky one. Okay. That's for sure. It, that is a tricky, and you start talking new products, it gets trickier. Even so, for not being a forecaster, it sounds like you're doing a lot of forecasting. FYI, so yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a fascinating area. I mean, I, it really is a fascinating area, and I just I. I personally feel like, I mean, this is that this is where it is in the future, right? I mean, companies need to, it's so much more competitive than it used to be across every industry right now. And, you know, getting, you know, a great forecast, getting people to use that forecast strategically is, 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 is fascinating. And I mean, to me, forecasting right now seems to be the place to be in, in many organizations. Fascinating. Well, one more quick, yeah, one more quick question then too, because I mean, I mean, I love the way you have it where you split out between, you know, the analytics, you know, focus versus the demand planning focus. And I've seen a lot more articles. There's great articles on the blog about that as well on demandplanning.com. But where you see, are there other functions starting to utilize the analytics that's coming out of your function as well, as far as, you know, using that predictive analytics for marketing, for finance, for sales, outside of just the demand planning, or are you kind of both working together towards driving other functions to utilizing the signal? Uh, yeah, so, um, Yes, we see it. Yeah, my, my long term goal would be to get uh, um, as in the commercial side of the organization, for example, I mean, there's going to be insights on, uh, you know, best ways to promote best times. And those are corporate things, right? Um, you know, those are insights that go to sales and they have to plan their events around it. Same thing on the marketing side. We're going to we're going to take this tactic. We're going to go completely digital on a particular brand, just for example. Right. Um, and um, I would I would love to be able to, you know, get an early read on what those plans are and have that somehow inform the, kind of the long range uh, forecast. A absolutely, my team does support. Um, really, we're a global organization, so we're supporting our whole globe and we're supporting almost every function in our organization in some way, shape, or fashion. There's a big hunger and thirst for analytics, 
And, you know, just having kind of our um, visibility to where all that stuff is, is, is coming from gives me the ability to try to strategically figure out the way to influence, again, that forecast, right? We shouldn't be doing things that, um, I mean, on the commercial side, we shouldn't be doing things and spending resources if it's not going to actually influence our forecast. That, that, that's kind of my take on some of that. Okay. It was absolutely fascinating, Chad. It was a great presentation. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, I'm hoping I'm going to see everybody at the Predictive Analytics Conference. Uh, I will be there personally. I'm going to talk about the uh, Generation Pi. Thanks to Mark from SAS for you know giving me that term. I'm going to utilize. And this please, he's going to be. Uh, we're looking at Chad's going to be down there as well, giving a, another great presentation along with many others. I hope to see everybody next month uh, in New Orleans as well. Remember, you're going to get an email after this asking for your opinions, suggestions, feedback on this forum. Highly suggest providing that information so we can make that, these that much better in the future. Also, you're going to be able to put, get a copy of these slides after you put, uh, give us the information in that short form, form survey, and your email will give you the slides back. So with that, thank you, everybody, and I will be talking to everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you again, Chad. Bye.